Well, good morning. morning. I'm Pastor Raul. If I haven't met you yet, I want to welcome you this morning. We are doing a series on the uh, kind of four, no, not four, five. We have five. Five core values that we see that we desire in our church. And um, about two weeks ago, we talked about historic faith or life in the word. And there are many things we could talk about with that, the apostolic creed, like all the different things. But what, what we felt the Lord really wanted to get to was something very foundational, which is that in the word, when we read the word, the main narrative we see in scripture is that God desires fellowship with his people. From beginning to end, that's his goal, that I will be your God and you will be my people, he says. It's covenant, theology and language, fellowship together forever. Amen. And then last week we talked about uh, spirit-filled living or life in the spirit and how the Lord wants to move in us by his spirit, dwell in us and work in our lives and our church by his spirit. It's not our efforts, but it's his within us and through us and on us. Amen? Now today we're going to talk about Christian formation or life in Christ. Next week is intentional community or life together. And then finally, sacrificial witness or life in the world for Christ's sake. All right? Now, Stillwater didn't come up with these. This is what Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. And really, the work of the Christian is to always get back to what Jesus was doing. It's always to get back to what Jesus was preaching, what Jesus was teaching, what Jesus was doing. And that's the work. Constantly, constantly, constantly. Because we're constantly being distracted, taken adrift by every wave of doctrine that wants to take us in all kinds of different places. And if we're not careful, we think that the new thing is the good thing. The thing I love about Jesus is that he's not original. Now hear me on that. Jesus is ever ancient, ever new. At the same time, Jesus is like, I'm bringing something new, but it's the same thing it's always been. You've learned about the sacrifices. You learn about the teaching. You learn about who this God is. I'm just going to reveal to you who this God is. Same thing. Same thing. And I love it. In one of his parables, um, there's a man who is dead who cries out to Abraham and says, could you send someone back from the dead to tell my brothers and sisters who don't know about you? And he says, if they didn't listen to Moses, they won't listen to someone being raised from the dead. And the implication is, I've been telling you about this for quite some time. Do you have ears to hear and eyes to see? So today we're going to look at a couple of different scriptures. We're talking about how it is that we are to be formed in this ever ancient, ever new Christ. So uh, we're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 1. And uh, what do we, that looks like 1 Corinthians right there. So we're going to stick with 2 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. If you don't, I'll, I'll read slowly, all right? Paul is writing to a church in Corinth to Gentiles. And he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Amen. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? 
For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who had put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were dull, made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses has read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Can you all say freedom? And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And all God's children say, amen. Can you all say glory? Glory. I mean, here's what he's saying. He's saying that we have a new ministry in the Spirit, a new covenant ministry, and you will be transformed from an old glory to a new glory. You're going to go from glory to glory. (laughs) Don't you all want to be glorious? It's not my glory. So what is Christian formation? Here's a working definition for us. It is the work of Christ in us. By way of his word and spirit, to renew our minds and transform our hearts so that we are conformed to his image. I'm gonna say that again. What is Christian formation? It is the work of Christ in us, the work of Christ in us by way of his word and spirit to renew our minds and transform our hearts so that we are conformed to his image. I want to read you something from Romans 8, uh, 29. Paul says this. He says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Look, this is what Jesus wants. Jesus wants a family that carries his DNA. He wants a family that is formed and shaped like him, that loves like him, that moves like him, that serves like him, that prays like him, that that lives like him, that is conformed to his image. This is about the choices that you and I make every single day. You are being formed by something. You are being shaped by something, even if you don't know it, even if you're not conscious of it. You have the voices of your family of origin within you. You have philosophies, you have culture, you have all these different things that are forming and shaping you, things that you've been taught by the world, shown by the world, and maybe have worked in in the world, and so you think this is a a good formation, but the truth is, is that if we're not being formed by Christ, then we're not being formed for eternity. We believe, we have the audacity, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the audacity to believe that Jesus can change a heart. We have the hope to believe that Jesus can change a soul, that Jesus can take a person who has been selling drugs on the corner into someone who is selling Christ for free out in the streets. We have the audacity to believe that someone who has been broken and beat down, someone who has been destroyed by the world, can live into freedom and love and joy in Jesus Christ. We believe, we hope, we walk the path that says fatalism is not the answer. That if it's impossible, then praise God, because God can do it. And if it's bigger than me, then praise God, because God wants to do it. God wants to form and shape us so that we can have a renewed mind 
that we can look into the hard things of the world and say, mm, Jesus got this. How many times have we said, because we've believed, we've been formed and shaped by the world, where we said, well, nothing will ever, that will never work. Nothing ever good will happen to me. That, all, that bad thing, that always happens to me. That's just the story of my life. You keep telling yourself that story, that's the story you're going to believe. But friends, we've got another story. And the thing is, if you want to be formed in Christ, you've got to participate. We've got to participate we cannot be passive or apathetic. We cannot sit back and say, well, I don't feel it yet, so. No, if you're not feeling it, lean into it. Lean into the unknown and the scary and be formed and shaped. Now, how is this supposed to work? How does the forming and the shaping happen? Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. We're going to look at John 4, 23 to 24. This is Jesus. He is talking to the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. And she's talking about her ancestors and where they worshiped. Um, she is a Samaritan. They worship differently than the Jews. And uh, Jesus has this answer for her in verse 23, chapter 4. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Now, I want to slow this down for a second. I want you to hear what Jesus is saying. This is probably one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. In verse 23, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. What does the Father want? What pleases him? You want to know the answer? It's right there. Jesus told her outright, the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Now, I want you to understand what I mean by the word worship. I don't simply mean singing songs. Uh, singing songs is not all there is to worship. Songs, music, is a tool that is used to bring the heart into worship. And here's, here's a working definition of worship. It is a heart surrendered to the will of the living God. And so that means that we who have hearts, who desire to surrender them to the will of God, we, day by day, we're worshiping when we're out in the world. Whenever we say, your will, not mine, we're worshiping. That's what it means to worship. That's what we're talking about here with this sermon series, All on the Altar. The image there is I'm putting myself completely into God's will, in God's hands. God lead me. God use me. My heart is surrendered to your will. And we need on a daily basis to find ways to bring our heart to that place. Sometimes the music can lead us there. Sometimes we got to drag ourselves there. Sometimes we need brothers and sisters to grab us by the arm and yank us there. To pull us out of our self-pity, out of our victimhood. And to say, no, you need to participate with the living God. He has a will for your life. And if you are not worshiping in spirit and truth, then you are not worshiping God. You're worshiping yourself. And so the Lord wants and seeks those who are willing to worship in spirit and in truth. Sometimes, friends, we know the end game. I want to do what you want, Lord. But here's the plan. <laughs> I'm called to be an evangelist to Australia. It's dramatic. It's awesome. Isn't it good? I want you to see who's really in charge there. I, when I was young and I first came to Christ, I lived in Frederick, Maryland. I remember I would sit in prayer like, Lord, I'm, I'm going to go all over the world. I'm gonna be, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to be big. I'm going to praise you, God. It's for you, God. It's for you. I'm going to go out. And the Lord was like, uh, let's just start with Maryland, Rob. <laughs> let's just start with your bedroom. Let's just start with this prayer. Let's just start with my will, not yours. We can find all kinds of ways to twist it. The hard part in worshiping in spirit and truth, being formed by the word and the spirit, the hard part is that we don't understand it. 
because so many things form us. We don't understand it. Look, I tell you what, I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, running a church is like running a business. I just want to tell you right now, the church ain't a business, it's a bride. And here's what I mean by that. The church is highly, highly inefficient. Highly inefficient. And always will be. You know why? Because it's made up of complex, broken people. And the Lord is working in all of our lives and all of our hearts. And the church herself is being formed and shaped by word and spirit. The other day, I was uh, drinking some coffee, and it said on the side of the coffee, vibrant and complex. And I thought, I like this coffee. It's like me. (laughs) Because here's the idea. Here's the idea. Is that we are complex. The church is complex. And the Lord is leading it. And the scary thing for us is that we don't know what the Lord is doing. And I'll tell you right now, if we're not in the word and we're not in the spirit, we're never going to know what he's doing. So look, I want to take you to Romans 8. Let's go back to Romans 8. We're going to look at verse 5 through 7. Now, now, I want you to hear me. I don't preach for fun. The Lord told me one day in prayer, he said, Rob, stop giving me good sermons. He said, you tell the truth. Because teachers are held to a higher standard and you will be judged. And I'm a pastor, and my job is your soul. So I want you to hear this. In Romans 8, starting in verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Friends, if you are not in the word on a daily basis, and I mean not just devotions, I mean you're reading it, you're really in it, and if you're not praying and listening and praising and seeking the Lord's will, I can tell you right now, your mind is flirting with the flesh. And if your mind is flirting with the flesh, it cannot please God. What pleases God? Worshippers of spirit and truth. If our minds are being governed by the flesh, being governed by what we want, We are not able to please God. We are not able to submit to God. That is why when you hear the word of God, you think, I don't want to do that. Because your mind is being governed by the flesh. Your mind is being governed by the world. I don't want what he wants from me. I don't want to surrender. I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want that. But if our mind is governed by the spirit and transformed by the word, then we begin to slowly come into it. Think about how many times you have said, I will never forgive that person. I can tell you, Scripture says, if you do not forgive, I will not forgive you. So the way this works is we hear the Word. The Word directs us. The Word convicts us. And then we come to the Lord in the Spirit, and the Spirit leads us and says, you may not be able to do it on your own power, but I will empower you. I will encourage you. I will strengthen you to forgive that person. If you partner with me, if you participate with me, I will give you my desires and my will and my way. And I will show you how to live in the spirit and in truth. But we're often afraid. But I'll tell you, do not be afraid of someone who can hurt you. Matthew, Jesus in the gospel of Matthew says, be afraid of the one who can send you body and soul to hell. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking to this church, and look at what he says. They're they're mad at Paul. They're really upset with Paul because Paul is not doing the dance. He's not entertaining them. He's not bringing all the big moments and all the big emotion. You know, Paul, if you, we have an idea of what Paul probably looked like from ancient documents. We have a, a rough idea of possibilities. Probably bow-legged, about maybe five foot tall, bald. Imagine Danny DeVito with a Bible, all right? That's what we believe. He kind of broken nose. Look, this man had been stoned to death. This man had been beaten. This man had been shipwrecked three times. He was not a handsome man. And so he strolled into a church and said, I'm bringing you the gospel of life, Jesus Christ. And by the way, I just got out of prison. Oh, Lord, why should we listen to you, Paul? 
He says, because I come with just Christ crucified, and I'm going to give you a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit, not a demonstration of my charisma or how handsome I am. And I'm going to tell you the truth by the Spirit. And so he says, do I have to commend myself again to you? Didn't I come to you and show you how much I loved you and how I served you, how I gave up so much just to be with you? Didn't I do that? Look, if you want a letter of recommendation, you are my letter. You have faith in Christ because of how I've ministered to you. Christ has written the letter on your heart through me. I am your pastor. I've ministered to you in word and spirit. And now what I'm telling you is, is that the letter by itself, the letter by itself is going to kill. The letter that you try to fulfill God's law all by your strength and all by your power, all that is going to kill. But if you have the spirit, word and spirit together, bring life. And he's writing it on your hearts. He talks about Moses and how Moses went out to Sinai and he got the Ten Commandments and he came back down and radiance was coming off of his face and so he had to wear this veil over his face because the Israelites were freaking out. Your face is really shiny. <laughs> and they put up this veil and here's what Paul says. He says, that was glorious, yes, but it faded. I want you to be formed and shaped by word and spirit so you know a glory that never fades. The glory of man will fade. The glory of God is eternal. There's another piece of this that I want to end with here. But Do you all know the story of uh, David and the ark in 2 Samuel 6? This moment where David, he has got Jerusalem and he knows that the first thing he needs to do is he needs to bring the presence of the ark back to Jerusalem. God must be the center of everything that we do, he says. So here's what happens. He gets an ox cart, puts the thing on the back of an ox cart, you know, the, the presence of God, the ark of the covenant that was in the Holy of Holies, he puts it on the back of an ox cart. Basically an equivalent of a VW bug today, okay? <laughs> Imagine the ark of the covenant riding in the back of a Volkswagen. So there he is, and they're all just taking this ark, and they're taking it to Jerusalem, and of course they're not praying the way they should pray, and they don't have the right people holding it. And it's not, he did not read the word. He did not look and ask the priest. He did not seek God's plan. And what happens? There's a man named Uzzah. The ox cart is bumpy, and the ark begins to fall. Uzzah reaches out and touches it, and because he is irreverent with what the Lord has given, he is struck down dead. And David is angry. Now, why is David angry? Because David knows deep down he did the wrong thing. He should have listened and been formed by what the Lord wanted. Not because he was impatient and just wanted to get it done. He was trying to be efficient by the world's standards. And here's the word for us. The reason why we do not seek to be formed in word and spirit is because we have no fear of the Lord. We, we don't. We think he's an elderly grandfather who's up there saying, hey, it's okay, whatever. I came to the Lord once and it's good. I'm good, I've got grace. That's good, cool. If we do not fear the Lord and we want to handle the presence of God, there will be judgment. But here's the good news, friends, and this is the hard word of the gospel. On one hand, when we look at the cross, what we see, this is what our sin has done. But on the other hand, when we look at the cross, we see this is what my love for you has done. So I want you to hear this. These two things go together. I don't know how they do, but the fear of God and the goodness of God go together. And so what happens is that David... The Ark of the Covenant goes to Obed-Edom's house for three months, and Obed-Edom is blessed because he knows how to be with the, the Ark of the Covenant. And David then brings the Ark back. He says, hey, I want some blessing too. So then he reads the word and sees the right way to do it. He does it the way it's supposed to be done. And as he brings it back, he begins to dance as he does it. <laughs> right? He begins to dance as he does it. He's excited. You know why? Because he's filled with the joy of the Lord. He's filled.
filled with the joy of God because now he knows what the thing is to do. He's being obedient and he knows freedom now. That there is freedom in joyful obedience. When we serve God the way he desires, there is freedom and there is joy and there is peace and there is love. And he's dancing down. He's dancing down, bringing in the presence of God. And suddenly there's his wife, Michal. And she looks at him and says, how can you dance? Because she has not been reading the word. She's thinking about traditions of man. And he says, I will make myself more undignified than this for the sake of God. Because I know his fear and I know his goodness and I know his joy. Now, friends, I want to tell you, this reminds me of another story in the Bible that I think is so important to us today. It reminds me of the prodigal son. That just like the presence of God, the son was lost. And that David... The father, like David, ran out undignified, running with his robes flowing in the wind, running to this son who was lost. And he brings him back home and they have a party and they rejoice and they dance and they sing. And then there's the elder brother, just like McCall, who stands off and says, how could you? I've been here the whole time. I've been doing the right thing. And the father says, yes, you've been doing the right thing, but for the wrong reason. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is calling us home. He's calling us into spirit and truth. He's calling us into word and spirit. He's calling us into surrender and repentance and submission so that we can know the joy of Christ. David in Psalm 51 prays, return to me the joy of your salvation. Restore in me the joy of your salvation that I can know you, Lord. And so I can teach transgressors your ways. You may have been lost, but now you're found. Will you be the prodigal willing to, in humility, turn around day by day back to God? Or the elder brother, like Michal, who says, I ain't feeling it. I'll wait for you, okay? I can tell you, he's waiting for us.